This month, the prolonged Nickelodeon reboot Zoe 102 was released on Paramount Plus, proving that in today's digital streaming age, studios are unwilling to produce original intellectual properties when they can simply make spin-offs and sequels to existing shows and movies with a pre-established audience, even if said audience is no longer asking to see that show and actually kind of hate it now. It's like if a five-star restaurant created an elevated version of SpaghettiOs. I didn't lose interest because it lacked age appropriate branding, I simply have a whole new set of things that give me diarrhea now. And so it goes with Zoe 102, the reunion film based on the iconic Nickelodeon teen dramedy Zoe 101, which resurrects the original series with about as much creativity as the updated title would suggest. So get ready to catch up with Zoe Brooks, played by Jamie Lynn Spears, fresh off her most recent role as a money-grubbing villain in the Free Britney movement, along with several of your least favorite characters characters from the early thousands original in a paint-by-numbers yet hardly coherent story, chock full of throwaway explanations for glaring plot holes, important character developments that were seemingly assigned at random, and an overall unsatisfying assortment of vaguely familiar faces that will make you feel a little sad, as though you just caught the vacant stare of your first grade teacher while volunteering at a nursing home. So grab your backpack and let's head back to Pacific Coast Academy for exactly one scene at the end of the movie for a follow-up to a show that fell off installment of Clip Breakdown. Hello, television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another installment of Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite movies, TV movies, and other such content here on the web. And we break it down like the boring story you told your friends about high school that we're sick of hearing. To look at each individual stanza and line and decide is this worthy of your long-term memory or should we forget it right away? And mama, this is about as forgettable as they come. It might as well have left my brain on read only. But before we get into all that, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week and turn on notifications. That way you'll always be the first to know when I'm coming into your inbox with a new invitation to my wedding. Because a wedding is where it all begins for Zoe 102, a feature film reboot that I will only preface by saying this was in talks of being a thing over two years ago. If listening to the drama channel Sloan which I do, because it's back then when Zoe 101 was floating around the internet as a potential new series that would come out, especially in the wake of rebooted Nickelodeon series like iCarly, and with the acquisition of Nickelodeon Viacom by Paramount for their new premium streaming service, Paramount Plus, which is where you'll find this. So there are obviously plenty of different directions you could go when rebooting a series from the millennial nostalgia requiem for a dream. It, for a writer, would probably be be exciting if they were sure that they could recapture the same tone and feeling and general excitement that the original series had. That was an added challenge for this production since the show's original creator, Dan Schneider, has since parted ways with Nickelodeon in the wake of many controversial allegations. And on top of that, many of the cast members from Zoe 101 have since spoken out against their difficult or toxic environment they experienced while on set for Zoe 101, which means, which means not every cast member did return for this reboot. Although some had to back away for supposed scheduling conflicts like one of the brightest stars to exist post Zoe 101, Victoria Justice. Other than that, the show's original cast can be seen on other television projects here and there, but many of them have simply not worked since the 2000s. The show's star, Jamie Lynn Spears, has of course remained in the zeitgeist. She is, for example, on the show Sweet Magnolia, a Netflix original. Although most are more familiar with her more recent time in the tabloids as a potential member of oppression in Britney Spears' abusive conservatorship. Supposedly, Jamie Lynn was profiting off of Britney's money for all of these years and therefore had a vested interest in making sure Britney Spears remained silenced by her conservatorship that was according to the courts, illegally enforced. So of course, Jamie Lynn Spears has some detractors and that's what made it a particularly interesting choice for them to go ahead and reboot this movie, which finds Zoe over 15 years after her final day at Pacific Coast Academy, the all boys boarding school in Malibu, which Zoe was part of the first class of girls to join. Now we find Zoe as a working girl. She is a TV producer on a Love Island type 
reality show called Love Fully Charged, in which a cast of couples has to either choose love over a fictional Pontiac charger that is sort of like a Tesla stand-in because it self-drives. Anyway, it's clear from the first scene, Zoe is very good at her job helping her main contestant that she seems to story produce for say the right things on camera, even though he's kind of empty headed. This guy's name is Jordan B and he's the production favorite to win. And even though she's clearly helping this part of the show flourish, she is overlooked by her boss. His name is Kelly Kevin, played by Thomas Lennon, who you might recognize from Reno 911, who in this scene passes over Zoe for a promotion to be a member of the live team for the finale of the show, favoring instead all of the men on the cast and crew. It's also in this scene where we realize this is an upgraded reboot, okay? Meant for an aged millennial audience, so we're not making kids television anymore. We can say curse words. It's some freaky sh Freaky new. Back tell Pontiac, if they don't like it, they can kiss my tiny little nuts. Ooh, that was just our first little Easter egg referencing the original series. Eagle-eyed fans will notice that the character Kelly Kevin, this temperamental showrunner who likes to talk about freaky sh and his unusual testicles is an homage to Dan Schneider, the creator of Zoe 101, who once again, Nickelodeon had to cut ties with once his status as an obvious pervert became obvious. Meanwhile, Jamie Lynn is like, wow, y'all, he sounds just like my daddy, but without the Confederate whole accent. We know, sweetheart, go to therapy. The first few scenes of the movie are devoted to letting us know that Doe's life is not all that it could be, despite her production job in Hollywood. Her car is broken down and she has to get a ride from her friend, Archer, who for some reason gets to drive the car that is on the show, like it's the prize for the show, but he gets to drive it around because he's a favorite of Kelly, Kevin. They, through exposition, tell us that Archer used to be Zoe's intern, but then he got promoted above her. Again, alluding to this patriarchy and, you know, all of these other, what some may call woke elements of the movie, which are actually kind of just, you know, a reference to what really happens. But regardless, I wish we could have had actual scenes showing that favoritism of Kelly being like, Hey, why don't you take the car? Zoe, why don't you get the f out of here? But regardless, Archer is still a good friend to Kelly, to Zoe. Pfft, these names are gonna be a mess. And during their car ride, Zoe is lamenting that life just isn't going the way she always thought back during the original series. I mean, her teenage years. I just think about all the things I dreamed about in high school, and now I'm here. Is this it? Is this the dream? It's really gross how often you talk about high school. Do you see why queer representation is so important in our TV and film? Who else other than the best friend wearing fake nails and Fenty lip balm is going to tell the main character of a romantic comedy that their personality is basic and the things that matter to them are making other people sad. In the gay world, it's called tough love or in the straight world, regular hate. You go Archer, now say something about how she looks like a tired Muppet when the curls in her hair start to fall out. It may have been intentional, but the the first few scenes of this movie make it seem like 30 year old Zoe is just one long workday away from showing us what happens when Miss Piggy misses a sleep cycle. And I'm not just trying to pick on Jamie Lynn Spears here, okay? In fact, there are several members of the cast of Zoe 102 who have been gracious enough to return and show us what their characters would look like in modern day, specifically how puffy their faces have gotten. And I just happen to be the sassy gay who was assigned to point out all of those changes while also taking some time to endorse meal kits and mail order coffee pods. Sorry, straighties, if society wants to be homophobic, then we're gonna give them something to be afraid of. Zoe makes her way home and is about to relax when she gets a call from our next returning character from the original series, Quinn. If you recall, Quinn was like the nerdy science girl who was always inventing these cool gadgets. And surprise, surprise, she has flourished in adulthood while also embracing her natural beauty by no longer wearing yarn in her hair and taking off her glasses. She points out that she had mailed something to Zoe and Zoe is opening it up, trying to figure out what's going on. Come on, open it, I only have a few minutes. The new tech mate, these aren't even out yet. The unbreakable see-through phone, it's even better in person. I guess it pays to know the inventor. Listen, I'm all for the fictional technological devices that Nickelodeon likes to dream up for their stupid little shows. But this is too unrealistic. Your mobile provider wants to invent an unbreakable smartphone the same way the CIA wants to invent a less addictive crack cocaine. 
cocaine. That's like the only thing that gives them power over the masses. Also, the hubris of mankind to call something unbreakable. When will we learn? Remember when they called the Titanic an unsinkable ship? By the end of that movie, they had those lifeboats paddling through a sea of perished passengers. Frozen babies bobbing around like the boba in your bubble tea. I know, not many people like to point out the similarities between that terrible tragedy and the fun Asian novelty drink, and even fewer will find a way to connect that to this poorly written character catch-up exposition. But I'm just one of God's bravest soldiers, I guess. This is where Quinn is joined by her fiance, Logan Reese, who was like the cool rich kid, one of the boy cast members of the original show. Kind of a douchebag then, kind of one now. Quinn is like, we're getting married. Surprise, surprise. Can you come to our wedding? It has to be really soon because I, as the inventor of the new tech mate, have to be in London for the launch forever after this. So because Zoe has recently not been promoted to be on set for the live taping of the, her show, she's like, sure, I can make it. But if she expressed any sort of hesitance, Quinn was like, please, everyone's gonna be there and we never see you. And that's where Zoe's like, people see me, I've just been really busy. When really, it seems like she's been avoiding her high school friends for the last 15 years, not just because she is grown apart from them, as she should have, but because her once flourishing romance with Chase, the love interest from the original series, died out shortly thereafter the series ended. Another reason you'll know that the Zoe 101 cast is in their 30s now is because they're allowed to drink alcohol. And instead of just treating juice like alcohol, as they do on Nickelodeon shows, they actually have hilarious dependencies on drinking. Not only does Zoe get drunk while scrolling through her previous friends' Instagram feeds, which gives us a sort of pictorial catch up on what a lot of these characters are doing now. That's just the first of several moments in which we see Zoe really reach for the bottle when she could probably reach for the phone and call a friend. I used to be your angel I just want to sing and drink and drink a lot. <laughs> Things aren't going right, so she uses wine to feel different. It's like drinkable pornography, or socially acceptable cruelty to animals. Always safe, healthy, and hilarious. Even more bewildering, besides the fact that Zoe barely talks to these people, yet she's still asked to be in the wedding party, is that they all live in the same city, or at least Southern California. That's when we go to the wedding dress fitting, where Zoe meets up with the rest of the bridal party, but before she can even enter, she sees Stacy, a recurring character, Character from Zoe 101, and now the host of a true crime podcast, which is clearly a copy of My Favorite Murder. She's talking to one of Quinn's coworkers and explaining why she would be surprised if Zoe even shows up. That's when we get a little bit of info about what happened to Zoe after high school that caused this rift. I think she's still stuck on her ex, Chase, the best man. They were supposed to spend the summer after senior year together in Hawaii, but they broke up. I don't think she knows that Chase has a girlfriend. They're so cute together. <laughs> oh, in case you don't remember from the original series, Zoe, the 101 Brooks, is comedically uncoordinated. She wasn't born a graceful ballerina like all other hot girls. Here, she's so cute and clumsy that she tripped over her own clunky backstory. But if you ask me, it's all an act because she knows how much guys love love a quirky girl who can't stand up on her own. Yeah, that's right, Zoe. I don't believe you because you never have any visible injuries after any of your horrible, adorable slip and fall incidents. And that only makes sense for anime girls. I need you to end a blunder with a broken tooth or show me a manic pixie broken pelvis. Otherwise, I am not giving you a ride to the neurologist for your equilibrium disorder. This got me thinking about the TV and movie trope of the smart, clumsy woman. So I read up a little bit more about it in an article called the dangers of the clumsy successful woman trope by Olivia Smith. Quote, these women are always beautiful, smart, and most importantly, very good at their jobs. As we saw from her time on set, that describes Chloe, Zoe to a T. <laughs> According to the article, quote, in order to make these women more palatable to audiences, writers and writers' rooms have to give them some kind of flaw. Successful women are written to be total bitches, think Miranda Priestly, or in this case, they are written to be kind of a walking disaster, end quote. Think Liz Lemon, Andy from The Devil Wears Prada, and also Zoe, who was always falling down and hitting her face on shit. 
During this dress fitting, Zoe accidentally gets caught in this lie that she tells in order to feel successful by saying that she has a boyfriend named Hugo Hemsworth, a distant cousin of the Hemsworth brothers, and that things are going great and she has a great job and a great car. She also agrees to go pick up Quinn's ring in like the some faraway California place, I don't remember. And she lies more about how Hugo Hemsworth, her fictional boyfriend, is gonna pick her up, all of these things. And sometime after leaving the dress fitting, she gets a call from Kelly Kevin, her boss, being like, on tonight's episode, our guy, what's his name, their favorite to win the show, was like asking where Zoe was. So basically, Kelly never realized how important she was for the show's success. So he's like, you gotta get back here now. And she then gets invited to be the only woman producer on the team for that live episode finale. But that means suddenly she has a conflict with the wedding, which she agreed to be in because she didn't think she had the job anymore. But she's not just gonna go down without a fight. This is where they set up the stakes. She really wants to get ahead in her job and also really wants to A, see Chase, who is the best man for Logan at the wedding and prove to her friends that she's fine. She's not just some girl who doesn't talk to them anymore. Uh, uh. I'm talking too much, it's making me sweat. Can you imagine getting this worked up and then having to go turn on an oven to cook a dinner for myself? It's not gonna happen. And it doesn't have to thanks to the sponsor of today's video, Every Plate. Every Plate, as you may know, is a meal delivery service that lets me get the freshest ingredients pre-portioned and ready to go along with full color recipe cards so that I can make awesome meals at home in about 20 to 30 minutes at most. I've been using these guys for over two years now and I can't tell you how impressed I am with myself every time I'm able to whip up a dish using a spatula in a sheet pan like a real person. In the past, I've done meal delivery plans where people laugh at me when they hear how much I'm paying per week. That is not the case with every plate. Every plate is. America's Best Value Meal Kit. I'm loving their oven-free meals that let me keep the house cool while I'm keeping myself fed. And I love being able to count on high quality ingredients from every plate. You don't have to sacrifice good quality food for a good value. And am I saving money by not ordering takeout tonight? Yes, so much money. In fact, every plate costs about 50% less on average than a fast casual meal. It's the easiest way to eat affordably. And if you have a particular diet in mind, then you're gonna love how easy it is to customize every plate meals by swapping proteins or sides, or even add protein or veggie dishes to your meals each week. Get started with every plate for just $1.49 per meal by going to everyplate.com and entering code 49 Nick Duramio. That's 149 per meal at everyplate.com using my code 49 Nick Duramio. I am literally gonna be crawling to that stove for some, some good old comfort food after this. That's when it's time to formulate a new mission. I needed three things, a boyfriend, a car, and a plan. That was me trying to get to the Taylor Swift concert for under $3,000. And guess what, baby? I made it. Although in this case, my boyfriend ended up being one of my sister's well-connected lesbian friends which is honestly a net positive because I didn't have to give anyone meaningful looks every time a love song came on when it was actually reminding me of my dog. Zoe basically uses her new position that she was demoted to, which was reviewing casting tapes for the reality show, to find the perfect boyfriend to help pull this whole ruse off. Some guy who does an Australian accent. His real name is Todd, although she has him pretend to be Hugo. And basically she gives the pretense that like, if you do this for me, I'll help get you on the show. Cause obviously he's a struggling actor. It's then conveniently laid out that the wedding takes place 2.5 miles away from the finale taping. And in order to get a car, she just steals that show car that Archer was using and that the show is gonna give away as a prize. And it's like a self-driving device that takes her to and from each location without much issue. A drive that they make constantly because soon enough we are at the engagement party. This is after we set up a whole bunch of kooky characters in Quinn's family, the grandmother, Logan is like all into making this a big fancy event, which is so not Quinn's speed with the life-size cakes and whatever. That being said, Hugo Hemsworth makes a dashing debut with his Australian accent pretending to be a pediatric surgeon and that gives Zoe the space to like run back to the set in Malibu when something goes wrong with Jordan B. Yes. Anyway, prepare yourself for the first of many commutes to and fro. <laughs> For you, I guess you moved on really easily. I have to admit, it's a little disappointing to think of all of the things this Zoe 101 reboot could have been. Like I said a few years ago, there was talk of it being a full on Zoe 101 series. Personally, I think we all dodged a bullet there. I could barely sit through this hour and 40 minute movie. That being said, it's still 
could have been funnier, could have been less generic. It could have even been a reboot for Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide, which is what the internet actually wanted. But probably for me, the biggest letdown is that it could have been about 40 minutes shorter, if not for the momentum killing, lyric heavy pop songs that pop up every three to five minutes in order to pad the runtime out beyond that of an hour long special. Me over. Your camera roll Check it, check it, choo That I'm losing my best friend I'm just waiting for your love If it's true, you're gone Zoe 102, now streaming on Paramount Plus. We may have no new ideas, and the screenplay may be written by the same artificial intelligence that handles customer service at Costco. But we also have access to Viacom's library of music licenses. So sit back, relax, and turn off your brain as we play the intro and first verse to That's Not My Name by The Ting Tings over another extra long sequence of Zoe's car on the Pacific Coast Highway, intended to help sell that this was shot in actual Malibu rather than North Carolina. Carolina, in order to receive tax incentives that helped us pay for Jamie Lynn's hair extension wrangler. Wow, this is actually great filmmaking if you don't think about it. There are many notable absences from the cast who you might expect to see in this reboot. For example, like I mentioned, Victoria Justice, but also Dustin, who was Zoe's little brother, who has been very outspoken against Jamie Lynn throughout the entire Free Britney movement. We're also missing my favorite character, Nicole Bristow, played by Alexa Nicholas, who has spoken out in recent years about the toxic environment she received on set being bullied by Victoria and Jamie Lynn, and apparently even the actress who played Quinn, so it makes sense why they wouldn't A, invite her back, and B, even bother to provide a backstory about where she was. Victoria Justice, who is still in good graces with the production, is at least name-checked by having somebody think that Jamie is Lola. And with those absences, they had to obviously bring back some of the recurring characters, namely Stacy, the podcast host who we just met, and and Mark. He was actually one of the other recurring characters who appeared most in the show. Now he's married to Stacy. This is Mark, my field producer. Husband. Uh -huh. You and Quinn used to date. Yes. I was just a fling, but this uh this is the real deal. Wow, I'm so glad Todd, who just met all of these people, was able to so quickly decipher how Mark and Stacy both connected to the original series. Because even though I watched a fair amount of Zoe 101 back when it airs, I didn't immediately recognize that they were on it. Sorry, you two. I think your parts must have somehow been suppressed along with an adjacent memory from when I was 15 years old. Did your first episodes come on the air around the same time I met that guy on Craigslist who would trade me alcohol for pairs of my unwashed sweatpants. Actually, I don't know how either of you would have that information. I'll just have to ask Sweatpants Charles when he comes to pick up these later on. Now, obviously, the central setting to Zoe 101 and the reason for its title being named after a class is because it took place at Pacific Coast Academy, where once again, the whole school was adjusting to having their first class of girls attend a traditionally all boys school. We haven't heard nothing about a PCA yet in this movie until that night after Zoe comforts Quinn because her husband is like all trying to make it a big fancy wedding and she doesn't want that. And Zoe has already spent time like trying to massage the fact that Jordan keeps messing up his image on TV by dyeing his hair. Zoe is like, why don't we go out for karaoke and just live a little? So that's what they do. And we get a little bit more info on what happened to PCA. You all went to high school together? So sad what happened. The school wasn't even accredited. Pete Rivers was stealing students' tuition and blowing it at Morongo Casino and Resort. Thanks, Daisy. I'm so glad that the TV producers think you turned out pretty enough to be a main character now so that you can verbally explain all of these complicated retcon events that could have easily served as the inciting incident for this movie. By the way, Zoe, I'm so sorry to hear about your little brother, Dustin. He was abducted from a Walmart in 2010 and that's what caused Zoe to start drinking. Seriously, what is with this generic plot and I have to have two prom dates at once? Like, those were all generic sitcom plots when they could have easily been like, what? PCA is unaccredited? Credited, and now I'm gonna lose my degree and my job if I can't go back and pass a high school final one more time? That would already be funny and interesting. They went with all of this nonsense where Michael, he loses his voice and can't officiate the wedding, even though Lyric, the soon-to-be daughter-in-law of Logan is like, or niece-in-law, is the Gen Z connection through all of this. We are gathered here today to celebrate this thing called patriarchy, used for centuries to oppress women by buying and selling them, kept the majority of wealth from the male minority. Okay. Paramount Plus 
has made sure to crowd the story with plenty of virtue signaling dialogue, at least as much as possible without adding any new main characters of color and without featuring any LGBTQ plus people prominently enough to piss off the boycott Bud Light crowd. You know, the conservatives who were so incensed about their favorite beer going woke by including a trans person in their marketing campaign that they hit the brand where it hurt by ceremoniously pouring out all of the Bud Light they had already paid for and proudly declaring, from now on, I will only drink Budweiser, Bush, or any other hard beverage from the same parent company as the one that was trying to destroy America by bringing my subconscious gay thoughts to the surface. Very smart for Zoe 102 to include other non-cliche characters and character traits in a much more subtle, less meaningful sort of way. Wouldn't believe how many mean women and non-binary people I get. You should do our wedding. Oh, I'm down. How do you feel? Like I'd rather be getting married in a lab coat. Okay, that might not seem like much, but just think about it. Those two gay guys were also Asian. And let's not forget that Quinn is a woman, but she's also smart and doesn't like wearing dresses. I mean, I don't really understand why a smartphone inventor would even need to be in a lab setting, but I guess there's no reason in showing a successful woman in STEM if science doesn't also make up her entire personality to the point where it almost doesn't make sense. Chase is convinced that Zoe's boyfriend hates him because of their like kind of karaoke battle the night before. And uh, Chase is going for a run when he smacks his face in a brutal way on the car door to her Pontiac made up thing and accidentally gets trapped in it with her while they make the two hour drive to Santa Barbara to pick up the ring. A bunch of shenanigans happen there. Zoe's fake boyfriend fills in for her at the bridal party, you know, being one of the girls where he also kind of lets slip his real accent and that gets Stacy's like attention because she's trying to find the Malibu murderer this whole time. Either way, they get the ring and on the way back, uh, Zoe is basically like, I'm sorry I left you in Hawaii that year after high school. And she's like, I just got worried that if things wouldn't work out, so I bailed. And it's like, girl, you are you are some kind of mess. So I just bailed. I've tried to move on. I've tried to forget. But no matter what I did, it always came back to you. I know that sounds ridiculous. <laughs> Wow, we finally saw Zoe 101 and Chase admit that they love each other and kiss. Only 15 years after, we finally saw Zoe 101 and Chase admit that they love each other and kiss. Everyone loves a prolonged will they, won't they relationship. And I guess some people will also tolerate a will they, oh, they already did, but now they are gonna do it again, even though it's less culturally relevant relationship as well. That reminds me, I'm gonna go ahead and cancel my Paramount Plus subscription. I would rather buy a crown full of blood diamonds than give one more penny to these monsters. At this point, Chase also admits that the girlfriend he brought, who Zoe's been jealous of the whole time, actually broke up with him two weeks ago, but she agreed to go to help make him not look like a loser. So blah, blah, both of these two leading characters are maladjusted. The car runs out of battery, and so the two have to basically run to the wedding as it's beginning, which to me is like, what is this movie? Why is it five sitcoms just glued together with horse hooves? But Zoe and Chase make it at the last minute and the wedding is going on. Zoe is doing her plan of using the earpiece to communicate with Jordan so that he, he can say the right things at the simultaneously taping finale. And everything is going well until field producer slash husband of Stacy, who is filling in for Michael, who's officiating the wedding, gets a lead and she reads it. And that leads them to think that somehow they never explain why this is the witness sketch of the Malamu murderer looks exactly like Hugo slash Todd. And that matches up with Stacy's suspicions when he did not use the right accent. It's you. How did I not see it sooner? This man is the Malibu murderer. I I'm not a murderer. I'm an actor. Wow, I can't believe Quinn and Logan almost got married before this shocking revelation that has nothing to do with their relationship or ability to get married. Either way, it was Stacy's responsibility to derail her best friend's wedding by accusing someone of murder without evidence. After all, she has the number one true crime podcast in the country, which also makes it the police, an elected jury, and the district attorney of Malibu. Zoe gets caught being on an earpiece with the production taping, and Quinn is like, why don't you just tell me you had to work? 
she was like, because this was the, so important to you. And then she's like, thing, no, no, I can explain. And that is all cycled through Jordan, who is on stage and on camera, making it seem like he's given up on his love and chooses the car over the girl that he was set to win with. It's a very cliche thing. I don't think I have to over explain it. And that's when mm, Logan, who is the fiance, is like, Quinn, what's going on? And she's like, and about you and the thing where you made this wedding too fancy. It's like, yeah, but would you still have a problem with it when it's all over? All of that fancy planning is done and you're like at the wedding. But she takes it as a reason to leave. Really weak kind of third act conflict here. None of this is what I wanted. I'm so smart. Why do I feel so dumb? No, not Quinn running out on the wedding that I never really cared about, jeopardizing the relationship that I was never really invested in. I think the filmmakers realized the screenplay hadn't done enough to earn the necessary dramatic tension here, but I have to admit, they still made this sequence emotionally difficult to sit through by pairing it with the worst song I've ever heard in my life, which we get to hear in full, marking the point where it feels like this movie was taken off life support. And now all that's left to do is stand around in sadness for about 15 minutes until we can officially declare it over. At least we're no longer in any pain. Zoe meets up with Chase on the beach who admits like, oh, we've both been lying to each other. And someone has the idea of like, if only we could go back to high school. And Zoe's like, that's exactly what we'll do. And she rallies the whole wedding party who should have all gone back to work by now, but they are going to return to the defunct, abandoned PCA where they can fix it up and surprise Quinn with the wedding she deserved. One on an abandoned field. Then it's just up to Logan to swallow his ego and his desire for fancy things and make this no free Rill's proposal to Quinn. I'm sure to most people that balloon apology would seem sweet, but it just hits a little too close to home for me because that's exactly how Pennywise the Clown let me know that I needed to get tested for chlamydia. Also, it was pretty bold of Logan to assume that Quinn would be looking out the window and ready to read those balloon messages as they floated into the sky. He's just lucky they were moving unnaturally slow due to an otherworldly wind current, or perhaps it was the clearly visible fishing line. Either way, he convinces Quinn to come. They surprise her with this wedding. She gets married in a lab coat like she said she wanted to, and everything gets tied up. Chase and Zoe even say, I hope you're in my future, blah, 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 they kiss. And the DJ plays the final song. Okay, they did Jamie Lynn dirty by making that her final shot in the movie. The director said, okay, for this scene, all of the wedding guests are dancing and having fun. Quinn and Logan are cutting the wedding cake. And Jamie Lynn, you're doing the Charlie Brown dance in a huge t-shirt with no bra. Okay, action. But all is well that ends well. Not without this final hilarious button showing that Hugo slash Todd may not be as innocent as he was thought to be. You guys get home safe, okay? Aw, look, little Dustin, the abducted brother, made it to the wedding after all. Aw, what a nasty little ending to this stupid little film. Starships were meant to fly. Hands up, your brother died. And that's all she wrote for Zoe 102, the worst movie I've seen this day. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Also give this video a big thumbs up if you wanna see more from Paramount Plus Nickelodeon reboots. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right over here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you so much for surprising me with a lab coat wedding. I will see you next time.